Good afternoon, this is Brown at IF Brown, and today we're going to be talking about Robocop 2, the Marvel Comics adaptation of the movie. And this is, um, oddly enough, a decent adaptation of a decent sequel. And Robocop 2, um, as a movie, was um, kind of in a difficult spot in the sense that you know, it had to follow up, you know, a movie um, that had gone on to become such a classic, which was the original RoboCop. And unfortunately, the movie wasn't as well received as a lot of people were hoping that it would be, you know, both, you know, fans of the original, as well as people who made, you know, the sequel. Um, but it's gone on to be reevaluated over the years as not necessarily a good movie, um, and, but at the same time as a decent enough sequel on its own merits. And I have to, you know, say that I'm kind of in agreement on the assessment because, you know, the movie, I mean, I, I didn't like it the first time I watched it, but, you know, fast forward, you know, sometime later, I got the chance to rewatch it on Blu-ray and it actually wasn't bad. I mean, it wasn't good, but I had a, you know, fun time watching it. Like, I wouldn't say it's a classic like the original movie is, but, you know, for, say, like, a Friday night or something like that, you know, it was a decent time. And, um, and I gotta say that the uh, adaptation of the movie that Marvel put out in 1990, same year as the, the sequel came out, um, it's a, a case of a decent adaptation of a decent sequel. And, um, you know, I gotta say, I love the cover art here. Um, the painted art by uh, John Romita Jr., um, who I honestly didn't know was as good of a painter as he was a penciler. Um, and, um, you know, that name might sound familiar to some audiences because he did a ton of work on Spider-Man as well as The Punisher, you know, back in the day. Um, he also did a pretty good run um, along with Bruce Jones on The Incredible Hulk, um, which, you know, if you get a chance, uh, you know, check out that run if you can. <clears throat> Excuse me. So anyway, though, um, that's you know, the painted art right there, um, the cover art. Uh, now, the adaptation itself, um, it was uh, written by a guy named Alan Grant, who's actually a pretty good writer. Um, you know, I, I remember him mainly for being the writer on um, the series uh, Batman Shadow of the Bat. Um, but he also uh, was the initial writer of the Robocop ongoing series that Marvel Comics put out uh, back in the early 90s. And I, I don't remember exactly you know, how many issues he was on that series. I want to say it was like, you know, eight or ten issues. Um, but uh, so the fact that they had him doing the writing for the adaptation of the movie, you know, lends, you know, some consistency, you know, to, I guess, you know, the fact that there was... Um, an ongoing story in, you know, for, for the character, you know, after the first movie, and then you got the sequel here. So, um, I thought that was a, kind of a nice touch. And, um, the interior art, uh, was by, done by, uh, Mark Bagley, who was a really good, you know, comic book artist that I think did some of the best stuff from the nineties. Uh, he did a ton of Spider-Man, you know, it, comics as well as co-creating um no not not co-creating but um he was uh you know one of the original artists for uh the 90s comic book series called the new warriors and if you get a chance to check that out do so it's definitely one of the you know best things to have come out of you know marvel comics from the 90s uh, and the inks were done by uh don't tony uh, dezunga or Dezuniga, I think is how you say his name, but he was the same guy that did the inks on uh, the adaptation of the first movie, so some consistency there as well. Um, and the colors, uh, the reason I mentioned the color, is, color art um, artists uh, is because that's gonna come into play in a bit here, but uh, the color art was by uh, Steve uh, Basiletto and uh, Suzanne uh, Delor, Delor Delorto, Del I think is how I say her name. So anyway, uh, yeah, it, it, the adaptation, um, it was based on uh, the screenplay uh, by Frank Miller and uh, Waylon Green. Um, you know, but since this is a Marvel Comics adaptation, 
um, they kind of had to tone down some of the more extreme elements, but uh, they nonetheless uh, do a pretty good job of staying faithful to the movie they're adapting, and um, and it, it it tells you know the same story as the movie, and uh, there's just enough you know differences to where you know it's not just a retreat of the movie. Like there are some things that you know were done differently in the comic than were done in the movie, but you know, at the same time, you know, it's uh, intriguing to look at, you know, because one of the problems that I had with the adaptation of the first movie that Marvel, you know, put out was that the artwork tended to be inconsistent, you know, because there were two different pencilers, and so you'd have um, the artwork going from, you know, gritty and somewhat, you know, realistic looking to, you know, switching over to the other artist, which would be um, kind of a cartoonish style, and so the the two styles it was kind of jarring when it switched from one artist, you know, to another uh, because it just didn't really, you know, have you know I guess a smooth transition, you know. But in this case though, um, you have um, one penciler, um, you know, in charge of things, and as a result. Uh, you know, you have a lot more consistency, the artwork stays the same, and, you know, it also, you know, happens to, you know, be, you know, very well done, uh, you know, the people actually look like people, um, I mean, I guess I will say that the one downside is that, you know, every artist seems to have this issue, I think, but, you know, because they have a certain style, a lot of their people tend to look the same, but, you know, in Mark Bagley's favor, you know, they actually look like realistic people, you know, like things are in proportion, stuff like that. Um, but I, I think that um, as far as the art goes, uh, it's, you know, it's pretty good. Um, it's nothing great, but I will say that um, I think part of that problem is because um, the, the color, the, the colorists on this book, I'm not sure what else they've done as far as, you know, other comic book work, but um, one of the problems is that while the artwork itself is well done here, you know, as far as penciling and inking goes, um, it's merely decent, like it's adequate. It gets the job done, you can tell what's going on, and so it's good in that respect, but it doesn't really stand out. Like, there's nothing that you know, makes you go, whoa, or, or you know, or things like that or anything like that, really. I mean, say, like, you compare the artwork that's on the cover, which is, you know, wow, and then you look at the inside, and, I mean, it's it's okay. It's decent. I mean, it's, it's not terrible. I mean, people actually look like people. Uh, you know, the action has a little bit of oomph to it, um, but even though it's kind of toned down from, you know, what the movie was, but at the same time, it just, it looks flat, and I think a big part of that is because of the colorists, you know, it just, you know, if you, on the inside of the book, it's very drab, very, you know, monotone looking, and so I just couldn't help but think back to the uh, movie of Robocop 2, and, and, you know, as, you know, flawed as the movie was, it was cool to look at, and a lot of that was because of, I guess, you know, the lighting and photography, and that was one of the things that, you know, helped a lot, you know, in that movie, at least, you know, because I remember watching the documentary on it and, you know, the, the, the guy who was in charge of photography, he even talked about, you know, shooting Robocop and wasn't filming Robocop in such a way to where it's like, you know, he was, you know, having the camera on, say, a new car or something like that to where Robocop would stand out more in his surroundings and so in the movie you know you actually saw that the fruits of that effort you know being brought forth but in the comic though there's really none of that I mean like I say it's not bad art you can tell what's going on and it's it's decent enough but it just it looks flat and so um, I just think that if they'd had uh, some uh, color artists who you know were I guess a bit more vibrant in their work um, or maybe you know color artists that were good at say you know 
enhancing, you know, the intensity or emotion of whatever's going on in the scene, you know, I think that that would have, you know, made things stand out a lot more. Um, but as it is, I mean, it's a serviceable job, um, but nothing to write home about. Um, as far as the writing, um, you know, Alan Grant, uh, to me, you know, he's usually a, a good writer. And in this case, uh, you know, he does a pretty good job. I mean, it's nothing, you know, kind of like, uh, I guess you could say the movie itself. Um, I mean, it's decent, but I mean, like he does a decent job of ad adapting a decent sequel, you know, but um, and, and he, and he does a pretty good job of, you know, staying faithful to the movie he's adapting. Um, but I did like how there were a couple of um, tweaks he put in, you know, that in my opinion, I mean, I'm not going to say it made it good, but in some instances, you know, there were a couple of bits that were better done in the comic book than in the movie. And just to give you an example, um, one of the problems I have with the movie is that there's so much happening, uh, you know, like things are unfolding at such a fast pace that you would get these, you know, glimpses of all these, you know, fascinating stories that the movie was trying to tell. And, you know, what you got, I mean, it, it, you know, was, was pretty good, but, you know, nothing was, you know, really allowed to settle and, you know, simmer. And, you know, the audience wasn't really allowed to, you know, breathe and take things in. Um, and so, I mean, you got, you know, a well done scene like in the movie wherein, um, because Robocop had, had kept on, you know, looking in on, you know, his former wife and son, um, you know, OCP, you know, was chewing, you know, it's, you know, some people from OCP, the, the corporation that was running everything, you know, they're chewing him out, um, saying that he's distressing, you know, his former wife and he's not a man, he's a machine. And basically, um, you get that moment where, you know, like at the end of the first movie, he had regained, you know, m mentally speaking, he had regained his humanity. Like he knew he wasn't, you know, human anymore, but he was more than the machine. Um, but you see that moment where he's trying to, you know, on one hand, he wants to, you know, talk to his wife and son, but he also realizes that, you know, it might actually be best that he just, you know, stay buried so to speak and you get that moment where you know he and his wife you know they meet face to face and you know he acts like he doesn't remember her and and he tells her that you know your husband's dead and what have you and it was a nice little moment in the movie but it was just kind of one and done though um you don't really see any emotional impact from it and the same thing happens in the comic book. I mean, the the the, the bit is done more or less the same way. But one of the things I appreciate about you know what they did in the comic book was that you know in the in the movie uh, you have the you when you you see him looking in on his wife and son you know from a distance, and then it cuts to you know when he's back at you know police headquarters and the OCP executives are you know chewing him out and then they bring his wife in and he says I don't know you blah 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 that's it but they spread it out in the comic you know you have um what Alan Grant did was uh you know he had it to where you know you see you know Murphy you know looking in on his wife and kid and you know his wife you know you know wondering you know if this is you know her husband you know there's something about him you know that kind of thing and then you know it cuts to another scene um, and a whole bunch of other stuff happens uh, in between, you know, that point and when the OCP executives are chewing him out. So you get the idea that a lot of time has passed. Um, and so, you know, emotionally speaking, um, you know, Murphy has had a lot on his mind. And one of the things that they do in the comic is, you know, they have the OCP executives chewing him out. Um, after um, he had been, you know, brainwashed by uh, Dr. Fax, um, 
you know, and, you know, he had all those ridiculous directives, like in the movie, that made him politically correct to a fault, and, you know, he had, and, he, and after he regained control, you know, he'd gone after Kane already, and so, um, that's how I do it in the comic book, you know, that when, you know, he's being told by OCP that he needs to forget about his wife, he's not a man, he's a machine, it happens after all that other stuff, and so when, you know, they bring his wife in, you know, he's, you know, telling her, you know, I don't remember you. I'm sorry, your husband's dead, ma'am. Uh, um, and so, but instead of, you know, it ending right there, uh, it, like in the comic, they have, um, you know, Robocop go to the grave of Alex Murphy. And, you know, he's thinking to himself, you know, goodbye, you know, Murphy. And you just see him kind of, you know, looking at his grave, and then he just sit, sort of sits down and, you know, forlornly, you know, just is lost in thought. And I actually liked that, you know, uh, what they did there in, in, in the comic here, um, because it just, you know, it, you, you kind of got to, you know, sort of slow down and take things in, and you appreciated the tragedy of, um, you know, Murphy's situation a lot more than, say, in the movie um, of RoboCop 2. Um, and also, uh, I, I kind of like the irony that um, there was a very similar moment in the adaptation of the first movie wherein, you know, after he finds out who he was, um, you know, he goes to his grave. Um, you know, but unlike in that adaptation wherein that him going to his grave just kind of rings hollow because of, you know, the fact that it glosses over that emotional scene in the first, in the first movie where he's going to his house and, you know, being confronted with flashbacks and phantoms of the life he had, um, you know, you, you kind of, you know, get, uh, you know, a moment that sort of rings hollow in the, in the movie adaptation, but in this one, you know, a very similar thing of him going to his grave, you know, it happens after a very emotional, you know, moment with his, you know, wife and him, you know, basically for the good of his wife and, and son, you know, and for, to some extent himself, you know, he just says goodbye to his old wife. And I, I liked that. Um, I mean, that was something that I did like in this comic book adaptation better than the movie. Um, and there was another, there was another bit where, um, when, uh, Robocop and, uh, and Officer Ann Lewis, you know, his partner, um, and when it gets to the climax of the movie, um, you know, it just seems like um, RoboCop, Lewis, and all the other police department, they're just there all of a sudden. You know, when, when uh, uh, RoboCop 2, a.k.a. Kane, you know, is going out of control at the, you know, old man's presentation, um, and uh, it, the old man being, you know, the head of OCP, but in, in Dr. Fax, uh, you know, she's claiming that, you know, initially Robocop 2 is under control, but, you know, he's clearly not, and so in the movie, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, it's just like Robocop, Lewis, and the police are just there, you know, like they suddenly knew exactly where, you know, who was going to be there, um, never mind the fact that, you know, um, you you know, Robo, there's no scene in the movie, you know, showing RoboCop, you know, learning that, you know, Kane has been brought back to life as a cyborg, or his brain, at least, has been put into the body of a, you know, highly dangerous, you know, robot. Um, but he's, he just somehow knows that, you know, Kane is the new RoboCop 2, and he knows exactly where he's going to be. Um, which at the time I was watching it didn't seem that much of a problem, but you know, but then when I'm, in, when I'm reading in the comic book, um, Alan Grant actually you know had it happen to where um, RoboCop and Lewis um, they you know go to uh, you know where Doctor Fax is and basically hijack her computer and um, because because uh, right after uh, you know Kane uh, had. Um, on OCP's orders, um, tried to go after the mayor. Um, he'd also killed off his old gang, and you know the the one you know 
person who was able to give some information to Robocop before he died was you know, basically saying it was like you but bigger. And so Robocop kind of puts two and two together that OCP sent something after him, but he doesn't know who or what. So he and Lewis, they go to OCP, or not OCP headquarters, but they go to where Dr. Fax is and, and basically go through the computer systems. And, you know, that's how he learns about, you know, the Robocop 2 program, as well as whose brain that they're putting in the Robocop 2 body, uh, which is Kane, who was the, you know, the manufacturer um, and overlord of the, you know, nuke um, drug. And so that's when Robocop in the comic, he puts, he realizes exactly what it is that they've done. And that's how he knows, you know, that's how he and Lewis know, you know, where Robocop 2 is going to be. And so when he shows up there, you know, at where the old man was initially having that presentation before, Kane went out of control, you know, the presence of Robocop and Lewis and the police department in general makes a lot more sense. And so I like that, how they did that in the comics better than the movie. So, uh, yeah, there were just, uh, there were some differences that were in the comic book, um, that made it stand out on its own, you know, along, you know, so it wasn't like, it wasn't say just a, you know, stiff, you know, imitation of the movie like I mean aside from the fact that you know the color art was kind of flat but I mean there, there were just enough instances where things were different to where you know it stood out on its own just a little more and also uh not to mention that Kane uh looks very different in the comic book than he does in the movie um he, he sort of looks like a, a magician almost you know because he has sort of like a sort of slash from Guns N' Roses type of hat on his head and he's got sunglasses and so uh, I thought that was kind of an interesting look for the character, but um, I did. I do think that um, maybe it was because of the pacing. But uh, one of the things that both the movie and the comic book have had a problem with is that you know there really isn't much of uh, personality to to develop. You know, with the character of Kane or his gang, like they're all there, and you know they do the same thing that they do in the movie, but. Whereas the movie, you know, had a little bit of a ch more chance to develop them to some extent. I mean, that's where they, you know, were, you know, some of the, you know, great characters or anything like that. But, to, you know, they had enough of a presence to where, you know, you kind of remembered them. Um, but, I mean, you, you appreciated them while watching the movie, but you didn't really go away thinking about them afterwards. But here, though, uh, in the comic, unfortunately, they do tend to be you know, a little bit flatter than they are in the movie. So that was kind of a downside though. Um, but, uh, overall though, I gotta say that, uh, they did a pretty solid job of adapting the movie. And, uh, and I, and also, um, the, the much like in the movie, you know, the highlight, uh, was, you know, Robocop going up against Robocop 2 here. And, you know, in the movie, you know, it was a really awesome fight scene. Um, and they do a pretty good job of, you know, doing a, 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 a sort of a, a comic book version of it. And, um, and unlike, say, mm -hmm. uh, in the adaptation of the first movie, wherein um, when Robocop and Ed 209 are fighting each other, it just, you know, it's, it's done in a page or two and that's it. You know, whereas in the movie, it's one of the highlights. Well, in the comic book, you know, you they actually went out of their way to, you know, do a pretty good choreographed fight, um, and much like the movie. And so it's definitely better, you know, on screen than you know, on page. But I do appreciate that, you know, they actually drew the fight out um, to where, you know, you, you know, people who hadn't maybe hadn't seen a movie you know, they were treated with a, you know, good final boss fight. Um, but anyway, yeah, that was, uh, that's my take on, uh, the adaptation of, uh, Robocop 2. Um, it, it wasn't necessarily good, um, but it was decent. You know, it's, uh, you know, it, I, 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 I definitely liked it better than the adaptation of the first Robocop movie. Um, and, um, and, but and, there, and I did like how um, 
there were there were just enough differences between uh, the movie RoboCop Two and the comic book of RoboCop Two to where it's like, you know, you could appreciate that there were some things done better than the movie than the comic book and vice versa. You know, but the fact that there were some things done better in the comic book than in the movie, you know, kind of you know you know, stands out some, but, uh, but yeah, um, it was, it was, it was, it was a decent read, um, and also it was, a, if I remember correctly, it was originally put out as, um, a three-issue adaptation, um, or a miniseries, um, but, you know, then they have this, uh, I think it, it was a, called a prestige format book, because it's like, you know, three issues worth of story in one book, and, um, and I think that, you know this you know ver this prestige format book in would actually work better than the three issue mini series because because you have it all in one book here um but uh but yeah um i'm gonna go ahead and give uh the robocop 2 marvel comics adaptation uh three out of five stars you know much like the movie it's adapting it was decent um and it was if, if you're a robocop fan uh, it's definitely worth picking up. So um, thank you very much for taking the time to check out my review on it. And y'all got any questions, comments, let me know. Y'all have a good day. Bye.